Hi, welcome to this Kickstarter preview video for USS Freedom. This is a brand new game hitting Kickstarter just starting today. It's a new game from uh, Dreamcraft Games, which uh, of course, as you can understand, it's a space sci-fi uh, game, belongs to this genre. It is a game that has a lot of cool ideas, many different things uh, blend together smoothly to give a beautiful space adventure. Uh, the theme of the game is very unique as well, and the lore behind the game is uh, very, very interesting. In, uh, in a nutshell, what the game is about, it's a bunch of uh, heroes, cosplayer heroes, that they were participating in a convention, uh, in a game con, and what happened is uh, there was a, a meteor coming to crash on Earth, therefore a spaceship landed from an alien civilization trying to evacuate 36 of them. So what these heroes uh, are doing, which are actually ordinary men and women, uh, dressed up like uh, Thor, like Panthera, like uh, Barcelona, you name it. There are different heroes, all sorts of things that you would expect on a cosplay uh, convention. Uh, but they have different abilities that they're enhanced through Ether. Ether is something very unique. This spacecraft provides abilities that uh, you can materialize your thoughts from imagination to uh, reality. So they start to adopt to their, uh, uh, to adapt to their uh, powers depending on who they were dressed like. So if they were Thor, they will start to have specific uh, skills and abilities that Thor would uh, have in this if he was a real uh, persona or a, a real person. So this is very unique because this spaceship is evacuating uh, those 36 heroes, but uh, there is a grander uh, adventure behind that. What players are trying to do is they're trying to raise their reputation with various uh, civilization, alien civilizations uh, throughout uh, the, the galaxy. They're trying to gain reputation with them and fulfill a specific agenda to complete uh, the victory condition in order to persuade them to lend them uh, their time-bending technology so that they can go back to Earth and save everybody. So there's a good idea behind the theme that it blends very, very well and there's a lot of lore behind it. But uh, theme aside and lore aside, let's see, uh, talk a couple of words about the game. This game is uh, much grandiose and much uh, larger scale than what it looks like without being complicated. It has too many things that really click together. Uh, beautiful ideas that come together to provide a space adventure like no other and I really really like uh, the gameplay because everything here works smoothly and makes sense thematically. So essentially what you're doing is you're traveling on a larger scale on an interstellar map from location to location visiting different uh, um, planets encountering different uh, uh, either aliens, monsters, uh, space phenomena like black holes or wormholes or even uh, entities uh, of uh, a tremendous power like titans or other alien civilizations. You do deeds and acts and missions that are trying to improve your relationship and diplomatic relationship with some of those or uh, you can avoid altogether some other civilizations because uh, you have a negative uh, and bad reputation with them. Also, uh, dropped even more with your uh, through your actions if you fight against them, etc. Uh, you can trade commodities. You can uh, pursue uh, attacking different uh, uh, spacecraft and different civilization, and all together blends well on a larger scale. The whole game is a campaign, a card-driven uh, battle campaign game of 36 sessions, which is replayable, can be played again, and each game is one adventure. So through that adventure you'll go through five stages, five phases, uh, you'll navigate through the, the space map, you'll encounter different uh, uh, locations, different uh, entities, different uh, aliens, monsters, whatever, you name it. You choose where you go, so you plan your trip and you encounter what you choose to encounter. You make some specific choices and down this path uh, you will encounter various uh, combat situations where you get to fight uh, on uh, different spacecrafts or uh, do ground battle and land your heroes and fight on the ground either on a planet surface or on uh, some space docks, etc. So regardless of that, the whole game uh, goes from adventure to adventure throughout 36 adventures. Every time you play with all of the 12 heroes, so these heroes are divided between the various players participating, people can jump in and drop out from the campaign and there is a system for that. And also you can save your campaign, save all the components, all your achievements or your upgrades from adventure to adventure, from mission to mission, so that you progress gradually towards your end. And of course, you can play again even from scratch. You don't modify or uh, alter any component in any way. So you can uh, also start a new campaign, play parallel campaigns or do whatever you want. It's up to, to what people want actually to do. Uh, the great idea about the game is the theme immersion. 
So uh, you really feel like you're navigating through space, interacting with different civilizations. And I mean, gosh, the art on, uh, and the components on, on, on this game are, are tremendous. I really, really like not only the quality, which is, I think, uh, something given for this company, but uh, I really have to shout about their quality. It's uh, tremendous, off the charts. Everything is linear and finished, top notch. Look at the size of this card. And if I show you how many cards they have, uh, you'll be laughing because this is the amount of cards you get with uh, uh, and all of them of course are going to be just some of them that you're going to be uh, facing uh, depending on your on your journey so lots and lots of gameplay in this game and lots of beautiful materials that they accom um, accompany your adventure quite well i would say uh, you feel like you're navigating a spaceship you have tremendous uh, stress on what decisions to make on uh, you know which heroes are sent to to man different locations like who you're going to send for the shields who is going to man the weapons or uh, do you going are you going to outmaneuver some or flee because they're too strong you know different choices that all the people together all the players uh, collectively need to make because it's a co-op game but uh, they all have uh, a lot of interesting choices and they will lead you one step further in your uh, campaign through from adventure to adventure so Without further ado, let me show you uh, the basic concepts and the basic ideas of the game. I will explain how the game works and the rules. And uh, at the end of this video, I'll come back with my final opinion about the game. But spoiler alert, this is a very unique and very, very fresh take on the space sci-fi genre. I really like it. Freedom is a fun co-op game where you get to explore an open world space vast area where you're trying to collect various uh, missions, complete various missions, get various bonuses, upgrade your heroes and your uh, spacecraft in order to be able to persuade one of the alien civilizations in this vast area of open space to lend you some time-bending technology in order to go back to Earth and save it from a full catastrophe which is another complete story that uh, gets to bring us in how you get to see people like wizards and robots and uh, elves and priests and uh, you name it, uh, all the different heroes that you see in front of you are part of uh, this extraordinary adventure that actually binds very well together once you get to know the lore behind the game, which is great as well. In a nutshell, all these guys were in a, a cosplay uh, game con, a cosplay convention and uh, they get to be in the correct moment in the correct space at the correct moment where an alien spaceship uh, crash landed there this is the spaceship of the uss freedom and before a comet striking earth and destroying it forever they managed to board on it that's why they're wearing their cosplay costumes and uh, by using the technology the advanced technology of uh, the spacecraft and the ether which is uh, essentially the resource of um, the game which helps them improve and helps them materialize what they think of as themselves, as superheroes and they, this grants them specific abilities through the course of the game. This is the way that they manage to navigate, control the spaceship, fight and do all the tremendous heroic acts in order to fulfill their missions through this campaign story. So what you get to do is you get to explore unknown worlds, you discover alien civilizations and you decide who you will be your ally or enemy. You perform various missions in order to increase your reputation with your allies while planning for survival attacks from numerous other hostile alien species. One essential part of the game is you try to, you're trying to upgrade it so that you can enhance your performance and your productivity and also in parallel advance your hero skills to make them more uh, fit for combat and missions as well. Will you choose to become a merchant, a trading legal or even illegal commodities in the universe? Are you more of a scientist unraveling the mysteries of a strange space phenomena? Or maybe you're a hunter and you want to hunt down different pirates or different monsters? It's up to you. So the game plays over a series of 36 standalone sessions lasting around 60 minutes each. And in each session you get to pilot your spacecraft in any direction you choose. So you choose to face the challenges you decide to go down the road to face. Of course, there will be various choices, various tactical options, various decisions to make, and this will affect your uh, relationship with the different alien species. The goal of the whole game is to, as I mentioned before, gain uh, 
diplomatic relations to a degree that uh, the alien species in one of those core wars that you see on the main map will help you time travel back and save Earth from this catastrophic event. So all this series of 36 sessions are unraveling your efforts together with uh, your friends, with their special abilities, with a magnificent ship to try to go through this uh, path, go down this path and try to save your homeworld. So in each game session of USS Freedom, Kosh Play Heroes, you continue your journey from where you left off from the previous session. Think of it like watching another episode in your favorite sci-fi TV series. A game session lasts of various uh, rounds, but each time we go through the specific five phases. We have the interstellar phase where we get to navigate on this space map here. Then we have the encounter phase where we choose to encounter with different alien species, phenomena, etc. We have combat phase where we get to do various rounds of combat depending on who or what we are facing. And then of course we move as uh, the player mat says from the combat phase we go directly to the conclude phase where we get to reap the rewards from the encounter if it was a successful encounter or plan uh, differently moving forward. If we are on a capital war we get to also upgrade our uh, spacecraft in order to make it more powerful and more useful for our cause. So the whole purpose of the game is a campaign. Of course you can jump in and play different sessions, but it will be so much more fun if everyone starts from the first campaign, from the first adventure of the campaign, and moving all the way to the 36th trying to achieve the goal. Players in this game they assume the roles of unlikely heroes who embark on an epic quest to save the Earth from being destroyed forever. Actually this has already been happening in the past, so we're trying to go back in uh, the past using time-bending technology that we are aiming to get from our friends that we're going to make down the road in order to save Earth. The players work together to complete various missions in order to receive powerful rewards and increase their reputation with alien capital wards. The successes or failures, or failures from uh, these uh, acts, it's up to the players because players will persist game after game in the path that they choose to go down, meaning if they're planning to go more diplomatic or more friendly with specific alien species or try to avoid other species together uh, because they're going to harm them. So let's see in a brief description because I'm not going to go through all the details of this game, uh, how we set up our game. Keep in mind that uh, once you get to roll and uh, have some sessions on your belt, then it will be much easier to concentrate on exactly what this adventure or each adventure has to unfold for you and enjoy its adventure respectively. So when we far start for our first game, what we need to do is we need to put the interstellar map, which is over there, on the table and place the five miniatures according to the image included in the rulebook. So I have already done this, you can see I have already placed the miniatures on the specific spots depending on the instructions of the rulebook. This is us, this is USS Freedom. Nice miniatures, by the way. And we get to see different core walls that uh, have different dice. The dice simply indicate the level of um, diplomatic relationship that we have uh, all the way from one, which is the lowest possible diplomatic relationships to have with this world, all the way up to six, in order to indicate that we're having good relations with these alien species. Each of those core worlds, core planets, have a die, a die to indicate the respective um, diplomatic relationships that we have with them. So close up, the first thing that we do is we place this white peg in the hole marker one. There is a, actually, this is a mat, this is very useful by the way, and there are different holes all around the edges of the mat so that you can indicate which one of the 26 adventures you're playing. And there is a system to save this within uh, uh, the campaign from uh, adventure to adventure so you exactly know where each mini is sitting, what is the relationship with each of the core walls, etc. So you place the white peg in the uh, hole marked with uh, one around the edge of the interstellar map. This keeps track of the games that you have played in the campaign and you must win before the end of the 36th game. That's the, the goal of the game. Uh, you place a, a six-sided die DX, D6 on the square indicating each planet and the specific relationships you have with each planet. This is a startup, so whatever you see in front of uh, your screen is exactly what is included in the page with the setup within the rulebook. 
And uh, this reputation in each capital world uh, needs to be increased according to your plans if you're planning to have better relationships with, uh, with each of those core worlds respectively. Or try to avoid different core planets if you're attacking them or if your reputation drops with them. Because most likely they will be hostile. Then um, the next thing that we do is we place uh, the navigation tile which I'm showing you just now. This is the navigation tile. It has different numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, indicating which side of our USS Freedom spacecraft we're looking at. So this actually reflects our mini on the interstellar map. So for example, from at the back of this mini, the way it is uh, orientating, we should have this specific core world. And this is the main uh, card from this alien civilization, the ions. So there is going to be a setup depending uh, on what we see around our mini on the interstellar map and this is going to be reflected by different cards that we're going to place around this uh, central tile. For the moment we place the navigation tile next to the interstellar map, rotating it so that it's facing the same way as the map's hexes and we leave enough space around it as you can see for cards to be placed later on. Next what we do is say uh, we put all hero cards, hero cards have this format, I'm going to come back with uh, the breakdown of the hero cards later on, so these are the different heroes, some of them at least, we're going to explain how uh, these hero cards work down the road. We take all hero cards, three credits, which are the money of the game, together with uh, a starting cargo, these are the cargo chips that we use in the game and uh, we put them all in the campaign bag, which is this cloth here. This is going to be used to store our uh, possessions from uh, adventure to adventure down the road. So, three um, uh, credits, plus all the hero cards, plus everything that we have uh, used so far. So the commodity ship represents uh, your starting cargo, the, the commodity ship. You can trade cargo at any star system that has a demand for it. For example, you can see that if you look carefully, all the hexes have different icons where you can buy or sell this type of cargo, respectively. And there are some printouts on the uh, Stellar Navigation map. So you can use this as a, a waypoint where you can buy cheap and where you can sell high to gain a profit, etc. throughout the course of the game. Then each player chooses an ether pouch in the color of their choice. These are the, those pouches here that are going to be including the different crystals, the ether, the, uh, which is the commodity, the, um, the uh, actually the, the resource of the game in order to upgrade our hero's capabilities. So we need to start with our starting uh, pouch. So what we do is we include exactly what I have uh, indicated here. These are 24 blue crystals three green crystals, two orange crystals, and one red crystal. These crystals represent the inner strength of your heroes and are used to power their abilities that they have on their card. Each player uses the same pouch throughout the campaign and gradually they get the chance to enhance it by upgrading it to different level crystals. So you take your pouch, you put all of those together, the, the, the blue one are the basic crystals, then you move to uh, the green ones which are more strong, the yellow ones, and then the red ones which power all your abilities, whatever uh, the level. So next what we do is we start uh, sorting out the encounter cards into decks according to their ID letters indicated on the bottom center of the card and place them to the side of uh, the main playing area. I'm going to show you now the cards, the encounter cards, but I'm going to leave them off uh, screen because uh, this game, as you can understand, uh, demands a lot of table space and uh, it looks great on the table with all the components laid out, but we need to put them aside for the moment. So you can see that there is a, a vast amount of cards in this game. This is tremendous replayability and a lot of value in the game and this is one of the plus pluses of the game. You can see that they are sorted out depending on the different um, alien species. So you can sort them, sort them out by letter or also by the color coded and the symbol. These are the blue ones and they have this specific color. The red ones ruby ones, the green ones, this is the back 
that I'm showing you from the card. There is a lot of text, a lot of decision, a lot of things on each of those encounter cards and it's actually one of the main mechanisms of the game which drives the whole thing as you can see. All these uh, different encounter cards, I'm just going to pick randomly one to show you. Let's pick this here. So you can see that you have the same number at the bottom which indicates which um, let's say part of the universe they belong to and you can have monsters, alien species, spacecraft that you need to battle, different decisions to make but even uh, space phenomena that like a black hole uh, or a white hole that you need to encounter and different things. So all these are the encounters and you will be facing those encounters uh, along your path and along your journey depending on what you choose to do. Uh, of course it is handy if you put close to your main board or the respective standees for all the different monsters that match this uh, part of the galaxy so that you can have them handy on plastic standees ready to uh, be used as needed through your adventure. Now that you can see the whole uh, game on the table, you can see that we are here, you can see that this area is yellowish, this area is purple, this in the middle is reddish, greenish, blue and white. And again all these are linked with the different um, color coded and um, letter coded cards, the encounters, meaning that in this area, for example, in the yellow area of uh, the universe, of this stellar map, we will find different monsters and space phenomena and different uh, um, civilizations and aliens and things to encounter with from this section. And of course, this links together with the central tile here, because as we move into one direction, here if we move to the red, meaning we'll move here, we're going to uh, encounter something from this uh, edge of the galaxy respectively. Again I can't stress out how much material and replayability you're getting with all this because this is just the encounter. You have so many things in the game like the combat, the space combat, the ground combat, uh, the different events, the different choices that you make, uh, the different encounters and everything but only from the different encounters you get an idea of how much gameplay you're getting in this game and this is one of the top things that I like uh, in the way they have designed it. Very 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 replayable. Now after all this is a campaign. The victory conditions in order to win the game depend on uh, the alien world that we're trying to align with. In order to win the campaign you need to convince a capital world, one of those planets, to share its time-bending technology with you by having a reputation of six with them and fulfilling its respective unique victory condition. So you try to pursue the victory condition that best matches your group's style. And that's another plus of the game because let's say I want to achieve um, victory by getting very very friendly with these guys over here. Not only do I need to get friendly by accomplishing various missions, I also need to match their specific victory condition and uh, I can choose to go for that gameplay or that gameplay or that type of gameplay respectively. Just as a brief uh, mention you can see that for example you have different alien conditions like the ions that you need to have one reputation with all other aliens. Good luck with that. Shadows which uh, you need to raid all other sector colonies so they're more hostile. You have Ephialtes where you get to collect all 14 different commodities so you're playing more with um, the, talk, the cargo tokens and uh, the trade uh, goods that you need to collect through space fare. Then you can have uh, additionally the equilibriums where you need to collect 200 credits so, so it's all about making money, making credits in the game. You have the unblemished where you have been asked not only to get six uh, reputation but also to destroy six different titans which is one type of enemy in the game. Uh, you can have the assimilators where you need to destroy 10 different sector starships. The Empyreans where you need to kill the destroyer of worlds, this bad guy here which is a whole destroyer of worlds and you need to fight him or her, I don't know the genre, the gender, and you need to destroy them uh, in order to win. Together of course always, which is uh, mandatory, having with uh, those type of uh, core world uh, 6 uh, reputation respectively. Another, another possibility is uh, to encounter and try to win together with uh, 
ectogna ectognathoids, where you need to destroy six, uh, nine different monsters, different ones, not identical. You have the Mycolords, where you have to possess at least four reputation with all other aliens. You have the Originators, just to show you the Originators, I have them next to me. So these are these guys here. And of course you can see the encounter from the back, I don't want to make any spoiler. For those, the Originators, you need to investigate six different space phenomena. So it's all about space phenomena like uh, wormholes and uh, different uh, exotic space phenomena that you need to encounter and explore and investigate and learn from it. And last you have the Ocean o o Oceanians where you need to have a fully upgraded ship uh, and no dead heroes. So you need to upgrade your spacecraft all the way to its full potential and have zero dead heroes in order to win. Of course you can try to go for one victory condition with uh, one alien species and down the road see that it doesn't make sense or it is easier for you to pursue another path and then can adapt on the fly respectively. So these are the different victory conditions and this is what you're trying to achieve throughout the campaign in this game. Just briefly to mention here that the campaign is designed in a clever way so that you can save the campaign from adventure to adventure so you can play a single adventure lasting around 60 minutes, save the game, uh, pack it and then open it another day and play another campaign and there are different uh, uh, logs that you can print so that you can keep a, ma a score of what you're having on each of uh, the section of the interstellar map or your upgrades or your different uh, cargo tokens that you're following and you're um, taking with you along your travels etc but also the game this is my understanding is designed in a way that this whole thing when you remove the, um, the minis it can be scrolled and it can be stored in a way so that you can easily unfold it and start playing right away so this is uh, the goal of the campaign players uh, will need to try to get well rela good relationships with one of the civilizations one of the core worlds and fulfill their specific victory condition agenda in order to persuade them to lend them the time bending machine so they can travel back to Earth, save it from a complete disaster and win the game. There, is a, there are some basic things that you need to do for setting up your first game uh, and that's that we have been discussing so far, but you can also uh, do minimum setup from play to play. So setting up after saving, you just unfold the map, you place a navigation tile where uh, in the middle of the table and then you check where with the pegs because you have different pegs to notify where the different minis, the different uh, um, enemy ships or friendly ships or your main vessel is located and then you can place the minis back on. Then you'll give each player their uh, ether pouch which contains exactly their status of the ether if it's a starting one or if they have upgraded some of the ether crystals to better crystals better combination of crystals that is and then you sort out the encounter cards into decks according to their backs like we have I've showed you before so that they're not from this side you don't need to see uh, what's going on here so that you will be able to uh, pick from there depending on where you navigate from the main map if there is an absent player uh, one player can uh, of course uh, assume the role of other players because you always play with 12 heroes so you divide 12 heroes between the number of players that they are playing. So if there is a player absent for a session, then the other players can uh, use their own pouches to control the different players. But uh, the, the players skipping a turn, they will not be able to upgrade further for this session their pouches. But they can, again, step in later on. You can even have people joining in mid-campaign. So it is possible to join an ongoing campaign. Simply you give to them a, an unused ether pouch filled with the starting crystals and then you enhance the new player's ether uh, as many times as the current game month number divided by two. So there is a system for a balanced upgrade as well. So you don't start from basics in the middle of the campaign. And last, there is the campaign log where you have the USS Freedom log where you get to uh, mark different upgrades on, uh, on the paper and have it a printout so that you can see if you have any fallen heroes, if you have any commodities and also you can mark on a separate uh, diagram where you are with uh, the location of the minis and the position of the spacecraft so that uh, you don't uh, mess anything up by packing it or you don't miss crucial information. So, there you have it, this is a game, so let's move to the full body, the full meat of how you play USS Freedom. So let's see the gameplay. A game consists of five phases. You have 
first the interstellar phase, then the navigation phase, then the encounter phase, followed by the combat phase, which may last a bit longer, and then finally the cleanup phase. So you'll go in turn order with these phases, one after the other one, and once you've done, you will have completed one adventure, one game session in USS Freedom. So let's have a couple of words for each of those phases respectively. First, we have the interstellar phase. During this phase, all alien miniatures move on the interstellar map and may interact with each other or the USS Freedom respectively, depending with the relative position. The miniatures always move in the same order. First, we have the Destroyer of Worlds moving as a first mini. Then we have Excalibur, which is this one. Then we have uh, Wida 2, which is this one. And then we have El Dorado, which is a cargo luxurious ship, which is this one. For each of the mini, we roll a D6 and respectively the number rolled corresponds to a direction on the navigation tile that we have in the center of the board. Then what we do is we're going to move the miniature one hex in that direction. So for example, I will start with the destroyer of wards, meaning with this mini I will roll a d6, there is a 5, that means that they will need to move in that direction, so they're coming here. Then I follow with Excalibur, which is this mini here, I roll the same d6, Keep in mind, this is a different D6 from the reputation, don't mix it. So this is a 4, that means that Excalibur needs to move in the direction of number 4, meaning closer to us here. So that's dangerous, we'll see what that means. Then we have the Wida, 2, again we roll the D6, we get another 5, means that they need to move that direction, so they will come here on this core ward. And last but not least, we have El Dorado itself. So there is a four. Again, they're moving closer to us here. So this is the basic interstellar phase. Now, depending on the position of the minis, we may have different interactions. If a miniature attempts to move into a hex occupied by another mini, then they may interact. If a miniature would move onto the same hex as the USS Freedom, it is immediately encountered. We skip the navigation phase and begin the encounter phase directly, using the miniature's starship and counter card respectively. If the destroyer of worlds and any other alien mini would end up on the same hex, the destroyer of worlds devours the alien ship and will return the destroyed uh, spacecraft miniature to the box. It will not be used for the rest of the campaign. If Excalibur this mini, and Wida 2, that mini, which are the bandits, would end up on the same hex, Excalibur attacks and destroys Wida 2, and then will return Wida 2 mini to the box. Of course, it will not be used for the rest of the campaign as well. Last but not least, if Wida, which are space pirate bandits, encountered the Eldorado, which is this uh, wealthy cargo ship that travels a lot of rich and uh, uh, very valuable resources, encounter, that means that Wida loots and destroys Eldorado, we return Eldorado's mini to the box. It will not be used for the rest of the campaign. Last but not least, if Excalibur and Eldorado meet, uh, would end on the same hex essentially, nothing happens, the activating spaceship does not move at all because essentially these are the good guys of uh, this area of the space and these are like uh, 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 cargo ships traveling, uh, transporting different cargo. So these are the two main uh, hostile minis and these are the two main, uh, let's say, uh, good intention minis, but their respective interaction has to do with what encounters what. Next is the navigation phase. During the navigation phase, the players decide together where the USS Freedom will move and which encounter card they will face. First, we check the hexes surrounding the USS Freedom on the interstellar map, and then we place encounter maps and encounter cards face down next to that corresponding uh, sides of the navigation tile. For the moment, you can see that uh, I have already set the central tile. This is reflecting our position on the map. Our mini is here and although these at the moment are face up because I wanted to indicate uh, how uh, what are the potential possibilities for us to encounter I'm going to put them face down at the moment because at this stage they should be facing down so what we do here is we place 
face down cards next to the corresponding sides of the navigation tile as I mentioned earlier, following these specific rules. For the miniature, we place its Starship Encounter card. For a capital word like this one, behind USS Freedom we have a capital word as you can see, we need to place the respective Alien Encounter card which has that capital's word symbol in a double frame. That means for this one, we're going to place that word, it has the infinite icon, so it's this civilization, this, uh, and this is the capital word because it's in a double frame. You can see that the remaining cards are, are in a single frame, single border, this is a double border, that means that these are, and actually this is the first number always, A1, B1, C1, etc. So this card is going to be placed, located on the back of the spaceship. So this is going to be like that, facing uh, the back of our mini, as you can see. So this is important because this always is the same approach when we have a core word next to one of uh, to the, the main mini of our USS Freedom. So for this location we are using, for this setup we are using the um, Alien Encounter card with the capital word symbol in double frame, so it's a single one always, uh, the first one in the number, number one. Then we're going to take for the remaining spots that surround the mini, as you can see, let's move this for the moment because we, we should have used a, a, a card for this uh, mini if we had this here. So we have surrounding this mini um, various hexes that, that they are either ruby cards, so they're red, or um, amethyst cards which are the purple. So we're going to use ruby cards from 1 to 19, R1 to 19, plus amethyst cards, because we have purple hex surrounding our location, again from 1 all the way to 19, all these cards. And we are also going to use the onyx cards from 0, 1 to 0, uh, 9. So these are the starting cards that they, we can find in various locations of the interstellar map and they are always mixed. So let's see how this would look like. This is going to look somehow like that and for the remaining slots next to the hex representing our spacecraft we will randomly uh, shuffle and mix ruby, amethyst and onyx cards and randomly put one on each of those locations here to make the full surroundings of our spacecraft. So essentially this is the face uh, down um, view of each card. We're going to only um, pick the card and move it, flip it face up to see what's going on. Once we decide that we move towards one direction and then we need to follow through the encounter. So this is the face down, this is how it should look at this stage. And keep in mind that this is representing the surrounding of our mini from um, the interstellar board. So in theory this should be something like that. And this is what our spacecraft is seeing in all six directions around its uh, shuttle. So if we decide to move to this direction, then we will move, we'll make the, uh, the roll to see uh, the encounter, what we'll encounter behind and then we're going to flip this card and we just skip the rest of the cards and put them out back in uh, the respective decks because this will be deciding how we follow with this specific adventure. So again, this is how it looks like and for the benefit of uh, uh, the example, let's say that we will decide to move towards this direction on the space map, meaning that we'll encounter these guys here. We have one encounter card next to each side of the navigation tile and without looking at the, the back of uh, any of those cards, the player decides which encounter they would like to face and move the USS Freedom miniature on one hex in the direction indicated by the navigation tile. And then we'll return the remaining cards back into their respective piles. So essentially if I'm going to move this direction, meaning in the map, on the map, I'm going to move from here to that direction, then I will be focusing on this encounter respectively. So from another angle we move from here, here indicating that we went from this tile to this tile over here encountering this card. So just in a nutshell uh, we are in, we went through the interstellar phase, 
we went through the navigation phase, we selected uh, an encounter, so now we have to move to the phase number three, which is the encounter phase itself. We're going to roll the encounter roll and resolve the encounter on the back of the card. If there is a combat initiated, we'll proceed with combat, and uh, otherwise we'll proceed with concluding this phase. So this is a big chunk of the game, uh, the encounter phase and the respective combat phase, which is uh, if you have an, a combat phase applicable. So we're here at the moment, encounter phase. So what we do is uh, in the encounter phase, the players face the encounter described in the encounter card. They choose during uh, the previous navigation phase. Depending on their choices, they may be rewarded, get a quest to prove their worth, or even fight for some fear, some force in order to survive. There are five types of encounter cards. Uh, you can have aliens, monsters, starships, space phenomena, and titans. Each of those have slightly different situations to encounter, but in any case, most of them will result, not all of them, but most of them will result in some sort of combat or negotiation. So let's see uh, what will happen with if this was an alien encounter. If it is an alien encounter, you attempt to hail an alien civilization. You roll your uh, dice, you roll a d6 actually. So I take a d6, I roll it, let's say I'm moving here, so I have to encounter this civilization. So I add to my uh, result my uh, the reputation that I have with this civilization capital world. So this belongs to the ruby civilization, so I'm even in a ruby hex. My relationship with them is one, as you can see from the ruby core world. So one plus five, that equals six. So I will resolve something in this encounter that is dictated by the number of a total of six. So I flip the encounter card and resolve the result corresponding to my total. Uh, you will be presented with two or more choices usually and you must make a decision as a group. If you engage in combat, you proceed to the combat phase and you set up for ground combat uh, or uh, space combat respectively. And then otherwise you end the encounter. You skip the combat phase and then you proceed to cleanup phase if there was no combat indeed. So just for the benefit that we're going to make an example of this combat, uh, this is what we are going to encounter. We have the Equilibrium Copper class. This is uh, the, the breakdown of the card. I'm going to come back to describe it later on when we do the, the space combat. But just this is how these cards look like. This belong to this civilization that uh, belong to the ruby sector here. As you can see, actually that's here indeed. So uh, then I'm going to flip the card and depending on my total, I roll 5 plus 1, 6, then I'll have to uh, select something in this first box here respectively. If my total was higher, I would move to this section because it's from 6 to 15. So for example, here we have the choice that uh, they're not responding and then I have an option 1, uh, do not uh, let them escape, lock weapons, you attack, initiate combat with this card and this is what you gain or what you lose. We're going to explain those rewards. You lose reputation, of course, and you gain some rewards. And the option two is let them flee, set course and sail, and then you end the encounter. So sometimes you have the choice to try to avoid uh, making your relationships, your diplomatic relationships worse or improve them. But sometimes uh, it's uh, more difficult to make the necessary calls and you have to probably fight. So this is a card that we would be uh, encountering if we were moving in that direction here. Actually, it's not one plus five, it is uh, three plus five, because this is the core world, the space planet, the planet which is further back, maybe you cannot see it here, but this value is three. This has the icon of uh, here, of this, of this type of core world, and it's three plus uh, five that are all so it's five. So in this case, I would go to uh, the second option. So here I would go to uh, this series of options that we'll describe later on. Now, a small but useful detail is that if uh, you have upgraded your Starship Bridge, you can add two to the result, and then you flip the encounter card and resolve the corresponding total, as I mentioned. This is the alien encounter, but you can have, for example, uh, a monster encounter that you can see such a monster here which again has uh, different things for you to do depending on the the creature or different things to if you need to fight them or make choices respectively 
So when you engage with a monster, you engage in battle. Actually, there is no choice. You immediately need to, to, to fight with this ferocious alien creature. So you proceed to the combat phase and set up for a ground combat using uh, either the planet side of this board or the space dock planet, depending on what uh, the card dictates. Then you can also have a starship encounter. You engage in battle with an alien spacecraft where you proceed to combat phase and set up for space combat. This is uh, the, the space encounter where we, sp we fight in space. The alien encounter is when we fight with an alien on uh, the ground. Then you can also have the space phenomena where, for example, you can have some kind of space phenomena here that you need to investigate or pursue. So for these cases you attempt to study a bizarre phenomenon and you have to roll a d6, flip the encounter card and resolve the result corresponding to your roll. If you try to decipher the phenomenon, you proceed with a combat phase and set up for a space combat respectively. And there are a few special rules that apply with uh, these cases. But of course it has a similar format as you can see. Last but not least, we have the Titan Encounter, where you approach uh, an entity of immense power and again you roll a d6, you flip the encounter card and you resolve the result corresponding to the roll. If you fight the Titan, you proceed to the combat phase and set up for a space combat respectively. There are a couple of more rules that apply for combat with Titans as well. So, in a nutshell, we have alien encounters, we have monster encounters, when we face different monsters, we have uh, starship encounters where we fight with spaceships and uh, spacecrafts from alien civilizations. We have space phenomenon when we have to investigate or fight with space phenomena here, or we can sp uh, fight with titans, which are uh, extremely powerful and um, entities that we need to win. Now, a couple of words about the combat phase. If you encounter results in battle, you wage it during the combat phase, trying to vanquish your foes and receive rewards or simply survive. First you select your combat crew by following specific number of steps, you shuffle the hero deck, you deal two hero cards to each uh, of the players, and then if there are no, in, not enough heroes uh, remaining in the hero deck, deal one to each player until uh, they're all uh, distributed. And if there are not enough heroes remaining to do this, decide which players will, only, uh, will not receive a hero card. In the next step, each player chooses one hero card and places uh, the hero card in front of him or her, and then returns the other card to the hero deck. You repeat the steps until there are a total of 12 hero cards on the table, or all hero cards are on the table, whichever comes first. And in this case, what happens next, each player retrieves the standees, the corresponding to the one heroes that they have chosen from uh, the box and place them on the area for the battle. Uh, then we follow the setup of the gameplay uh, depending on if we have a combat that is on the ground or if it's a combat on the space. Combat is played over a series of rounds until all enemies are defeated, all participating heroes are dead or the USS Freedom is destroyed. Space combat only uh, possibility. Uh, also, the combat might end early thanks to an opportunity card or either if uh, your opponent uh, forces you to flee or if you flee yourself from the battle. So what you see in front of you this is a ground uh, setup, a setup for a ground combat but uh, we'll also do um, an example for a space combat as well and show you how this works. So a quick word about um, the hero cards and the anatomy. Let's focus on Thor for example. Each of those have the same anatomy. You can see the hero skills on the top left of the card. Uh, you can see the different icons from top to bottom for strength, agility, engineering and willpower. And of course there is a health for each of the heroes for 10 health points uh, that they can endure before they, are di they, uh, they die. Uh, but this is not uh, depicted on the card. Like with most of the things in this game, in order to indicate the hit points you simply put cubes of denomination of one on the card to indicate that they have received that amount of cubes. This is one, this is five, and this is ten. Of course, as I said, they can take up to ten hit points before the die. Now, uh, there are different things on the card as well. The name of the hero, this is Thor, this is Panthera, this is, for example, Cthulhu. You can pick the heroes during the previous phase. And you also have the hero abilities that they are linked with different ether crystals. You see, this is the blue, the basic one, then the green, then the yellow or orange, and then the red one. 
and then again this has to do with your pouches and the ether crystals you have in your pouch respectively so a couple of words about each of those uh, hero skills let's start with uh, first the strength uh, strength is used for reducing incoming combat damage also it is used for raising the starship shields they produce sealed cubes it will make sense later on when we describe the space combat here agility the second stat has to do with of course uh, uh, movement it is used for movement speed your movement is your agility plus one so this guy can move up to two this guy can move up to three and this guy uh, panthera she can move up to four respectively engineering uh, oh, and also agility is used for piloting I mentioned to, to I forgot to mention uh, it can be used for piloting the starship so they produce thrust cubes but it will make sense when we discuss about about thrust over here later on and they're used for firing the starship weapons and they produce weapon damage when they fire the weapons from the firing locations when they're manning uh, you cannot see it now the different tiles for using the weapon systems uh, there is a, the engineering here as well, which is the COG value. This is linked with operating the Starship engine, producing energy cubes in the engine rooms in order to uh, give engine cubes to the rest of uh, the heroes in their uh, operating post so they can uh, do their thing respectively. Uh, they are used for repairing damage on Starship, remove damage cubes. They are used for deciphering phenomena as specified on the encounter card and they're used for using specific items as, again linked with specific card instructions the last stat is this crown here is the willpower it is used for diplomatic actions indicated on the encounter card itself also used for deciphering specific phenomena and they can be used for using items as well the last thing i want to mention is the ether abilities remember we start with a specific amount of ether in our pouch each player uh, each uh, player is going to get one of those uh, as per setup instructions so every hero can activate one of their uh, ether abilities every combat round as an action they have these specific abilities here and they're linked with specific color of crystals to activate a hero's ability you spend a crystal on the hero's card that is on a level equal to or higher than the level of the ability itself that's by spending a blue crystal so if we're on a previous round we'll see how they accumulate crystals on the cards if from a previous uh, round this hero thor had blue crystals they can spend as an action one blue crystal to perform the blue basic skill described here the same would go for the different uh, heroes respectively now uh, you may also spend two crystals of a single level to treat them as one crystal of the next highest level meaning I can spend two blue crystals and use them as if I had the next level crystal which is green so the hierarchy is blue green yellow red let me put them here for you to easily see blue green yellow and red and that's why you see start with only one red because your red ability is the strongest one as you can imagine so I can spend for example from my hero card two blue crystals to use them as a virtual green so I return them um, to use them and then I can use my green stronger skill or I can use one green and uh, for example two green and one yellow and then I can use them as one red for example and so on so that's very important and one core part of the game is you try to uh, improve your pouch by enhancing your ether crystals and replacing lower value crystals with higher value crystals because when you spend a red crystal you can do any of those when you spend an orange one you can do this one that one and that one but if you spend only uh, blue ones uh, one blue you can only do this one of course you can make pairs as i explained uh, previously many ether abilities are special attacks your hero can use against enemies others are enhanced versions of actions everyone can do uh, and of course uh, uh, you can uh, do repairs do improved firing or a special combat etc you can find information about each of the hero abilities within the additional rulebook that they are preparing uh, with the main rulebook for the game.
a quick look on the combat uh, on the different enemy cards again we're still in the combat phase as you can see that we can have different enemy cards like these atlanteans here or you can have different uh, space shadows that you need to fight like this shadow trigoi class etc so they they share some common uh, card anatomy skills uh, actually so you can see in this the um, health of the enemy card how many hit points an alien on monster has you can see their strength which is used for reducing incoming combat damage respectively you can see their willpower which is used for diplomatic actions as specified on the encounter card as well and last but not least you can see the capital ward and encounter level indicates the capital ward whose reputation will be affected by the encounter indicated uh, by the level which is the number next to it so the same goes for this type of cards the spacecraft cards you can see again the health these are the health points that they can uh, uh, they need to get how many health points uh, the starship or titan has then you have the thruster this is used for starship thrust they also have willpower uh, used for diplomatic actions and similarly they have um, the capital ward and encounter level that they belong to indicates the capital ward whose reputation of course will be affected as indicated uh, um, by the card and the level will be the number respectively uh, these are the starship skills and these are this is the name of the starship shadow strigoi class and all these here are the different abilities they have the same goes for um, the aliens or the monsters they have special abilities here color coded similarly like uh, the starship so this is how all of the cards of the game look like a quick look of uh, our uss freedom you can see that it has different locations like this for example this is a thruster and you can place one study here to the thrusters to begin with on this thruster tile you have uh, uh, empty cargo spaces uh, this is just an advanced look of how it would look but you can see below there are different cargo spaces where you can fit cargo like this here it has one commodity token or this here has commodity token as well you also have engine which is this one the pre-printed one and you need to put one standy here during setup the other one needs to be upgraded down the campaign in order to have more powerful engine like i'm doing showing you now the same goes with the shields you have one shield one shield to start with which is this one and you need to put one study here as well during setup and uh, uh, the one the next one needs to be upgraded so that you can have to same goes with uh, thrusters you only have one thruster this is a pre-printed one the next one needs to be upgraded and all these weapons are also upgrades you don't have that many weapons to begin with we only have you only have one here and the rest are empty cargo spaces like so this is an upgrade version of our uss freedom which will be more likely to look like that down the road in the campaign so we can have space combat and we can have ground combat depending on the scenario and the encounter card and there are some simple rules that apply uh, we follow this phase of combat respectively if we win most probably we'll get the rewards we can either flee as you heard before regardless of the outcome of uh, the combat phase which is the fourth phase in the game you set up the starship or planet board you take the ether pouch and select heroes you allocate heroes and enemies on the board and then you initiate combat with the card respectively when we finish with the combat phase which will run which will last several rounds until one of the outcomes is uh, uh, encountered then we'll move to the conclude phase where essentially we're going to do some cleanup and then follow our adventure uh, finish our adventure respectively and be ready for the next one on the next game session so for space combat you may end up in space combat situation by resolving starship space phenomena or titan encounter cards and in space combat your heroes tend the different stations of the uss freedom by putting standees there following some specific rules and they're trying to man their location uh, correctly as good as possible as efficient as possible in order to uh, achieve the goal which is to win against the upcoming combat so to set up for a space combat you follow some steps first of all you place the starship board on the table i'm already having this placed on the mid on the middle of the table uh, from the beginning of this video 
and then uh, you place all purchased upgrade tiles that you have in the pouch so if you have any upgrade uh, tiles you put them uh, on the respective location keep in mind that the number is the same so if you have upgraded 10 with a second tile for an even stronger engine when it's combined with the other tile you just put number 10 on top of ramp number 10 so this is an upgrade of course you can have various upgrades that you can use throughout um, the course of the campaign and they all cost credits and this is one of the things that you can do at the end of uh, the upkeep phase if you're on a, a core planet you can upgrade by adding up um, you can um, purchase upgrades on the planet itself so if you have any we're going to position all these upgrades uh, and reflect our current status of our space uh, uss freedom spacecraft the next thing we do is we assign hero standees on the starship uh, so we need to put one on thrusters if you have one thruster tile we only put one if you have two thruster tiles we put one here and one there at least one then one on weapons which is hex number five the preprinted one if we have upgraded and have more weapons we put more there of course we put one on engine this is a preprinted one number eight if we have more upgrades we put there one study as well from our heroes there the hero standees of course goes without saying match the selected heroes that we have the 12 selected heroes i only have six displaying but there are 12 in total according to uh, each game we're going to use always 12. and then we have also the shields we put one on the number 12 the preprinted one if we have upgrades for a second shield room we put another one and that means that all the functional um, locations on the shuttle have at least one standee all the remaining standees go at the bridge which is this one at the top here so this is the setup for uh, the beginning of the combat round we shuffle all action chips that they are here and they depict different uh, combination of colors the colors as you can see match the different colors here so if they attack with a, a pyro missile with uh, missiles with the attack uh, on a specific quadrant of the space uh, shuttle so from this direction or that direction it's all indicated here on the card of um, what we encounter and you can see that this is a nice system to really randomize um, and uh, create let's say an ai for uh, how these uh, guys will attack in general or whatever encounter uh, for that matter so we shuffle the action chips and stack them face down to create the enemy action stack the white stack i just made if a, a flying if a fighting a miniature we remove two blue action chips before sh uh, shuffling the stack and uh, when engaging in uh, space combat against titans or space phenomena uh, there are some added special rules that we'll describe later on and when then we go through a round some rounds of space combat which is subdivided in five more phases uh, as well so we are still in combat phase and each round of combat phase has five segments that they go with a specific section we have the upkeep we have the ether the movement the actions and we have also uh, then uh, the different actions that we choose from and then the enemy uh, plays uh, fights back so this is a space combat round we see we have the upkeep then we have a, a ether movement and the different actions and then we have the enemy playing uh, at the end of this sequence I, I think it's also mentioned in uh, this section here so let's see all of these sub phases how do they work I'm repeating upkeep ether movement actions different type of actions from the heroes and then the last is the enemy plays its turn so let's see how they work first of all we have the upkeep it's important uh, that uh, if we initiated combat we skip this step during the first round basically we catch the enemy by surprise so they don't uh, do the upkeep phase they simply have to reply to um, our attack which is we have the initiate so we start if that's not uh, if we didn't initiate the combat then we, uh, this upkeep goes uh, regularly in the routine of the combat round so if there are any hero cards turned on their side we need to turn them right facing up so if anything is tapped needs to be facing up respectively 
Then in the first run we do not draw any action chips, meaning those white chips over there. Uh, what we do is all enemy activate their blue ability, so they go directly with this one, the Abyssal Flames, one Pyro Missile, and this is how they disperse it, we'll see what that means in a bit. Uh, all enemies activate their blue abilities in uh, every other round. For each enemy, we reveal the top action chip from here and respectively we will do uh, the specific color that indicates. If it is a blue, we'll do exactly the same. If it is a yellow, we'll do four missiles here. If it is a green, we'll do that box. If it is a red, we'll do that one. If it is a white one, it could be that uh, you reveal a white action chip, then you, do, uh, you draw and resolve an opportunity card instead and we'll see how uh, this works as well. It's very simple, you just make some selections and you uh, continue normally. So let's see a closer look on those cards here. Because as you can see, they have next to the color, which dictates what type of attack they will do, they also have some kind of icons that you can see. So you can either have, for example, this icon here, which has just one red section uh, highlighted. This symbol means you divide the indicated number of attack chips among the position, the, the position spaces of the indicated quadrant. So they're going to attack from the bottom right, meaning their attack will be 12, 11 and 10 here. They will be on these sections and this is linked with room 10, this is linked with room 11 and this is linked with room 12, as you can see. So this type of attack, it will be three missiles coming here indicating that this is their planned attack, okay? As you can see. If there is another icon, like for example this one, that means it has uh, more highlighted sections, or even all, and a D in the middle, that means this symbol means that you roll a D12, which is a die here, and then what you do is once you roll the, the D12, uh, once for each attack chip, and you place it on uh, the position that comes in the number. So if it was a four, this will go on number four on the top. If it goes a 10, it will go on number 10, etc. So the D12 dictates where you're going to position those. If this, um, uh, if, if this has highlighted with red all of the quadrants of around uh, USS Freedom. And if there is something like that, for example, this is a pyro missile. This means that um, this is uh, actually not a paramiso, this is a D, meaning that uh, it goes, uh, you roll the D12, uh, and since there is no highlight around it, that means that you place all attack chips on the, pos uh, the position space that is a result of um, uh, the die. If there is a number in there, you go to the specific number. So if it says 6, then you're going to place 3 missiles to 6. If it says this quadrant, you're going to divide them as uh, evenly as possible, starting again 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. on this quadrant. If you need to roll a die, you roll a d12 and then you go to this location respectively. So these are the possible configurations of the attack. This is where the enemy is planning their attack respectively. So let's put that back. Then we shuffle the thruster chips. So keep in mind this uh, guy here has one under thrusters. So we shuffle the thruster chips and we check the encounter card to find out whether to place one or two thruster chips face down to the thruster spaces of the starboard. So these are the thruster uh, chips, they can be zero, one or two. We will shuffle them and we will put either one or two depending on the enemy we're facing. Here we need to put one. Okay, so let's put that here. So this is the thruster of what we're facing at the moment. Then we shuffle the shield chips and place them face down on the enemy shield on this location. So you can see that these are the enemy shields. And this is something that you need to uh, clearly understand at the beginning. These shields are a cap. This is a barrier. You can do up to five damage on this side, up to four, up to six and up to seven, depending on which one you target. So we shuffle them and we don't know uh, where they have divided their power uh, for their shields at the moment, we have to go and find out. We skip this test, this step, if, it is, uh, if we initiated combat, and whatever we, 
fire upon them goes directly to their hull. But if it is a subsequent round, we need to go through the shields step respectively. You'll see later on. If there are any fire or virus or radiation chips, their effect uh, is resolved now. Essentially, there are uh, more nasty damages that if they have, if we have, for example, uh, one or two fire damage, that means that it's a result of uh, the pyro missile, for example. That means that every uh, hero standing there and the tile itself get one damage and also anyone adjacent. They have some special abilities. The normal one of the attack, the normal attack ones are the normal damage, which I have this damage icon and you stack cubes saying, for example, here you have four damage for this room. If a room goes up to 10, then it's destroyed. It can get up to 10 uh, hit points, so be careful. Same goes with the heroes. But if it is a pyro uh, damage or a virus or radiation damage, you get additional nasty effect that you need to resolve soon in order to survive. So, we spoke about opportunity cards before. When a white action chip is drawn, somewhere here we should have a white action chip. These are really cool actually, I really like them. So if this action, white action chip is drawn, what we need to do is instead of this type of uh, activation, blue, green, uh, yellow or red, what we do is um, we resolve an opportunity card. Essentially, we uh, draw a random opportunity card of a type corresponding to the encounter card, alien, monster, uh, titan or space phenomena. So these are further divided depending on the different types of uh, uh, categorization that I just mentioned. So you pick from there. And these are quite nice because they provide a lot of um, interesting choices. You read the opportunity card and choose one of, or, uh, one of uh, the two available options. And then you flip the card and read the result of the selected options. Once the opportunity card is resolved, then you return the white chip and, uh, to the box and you shuffle the action chips uh, in the discard pile uh, with the action stack and you make a new one. So for example, just give you an indication, a lethal injury. While fighting the aliens, you manage to land a devastating hit on some of them. Uh, howling in pain, they start stepping backwards, looking around for an escape route. Maybe you have the possibility to negotiate their surrender. Will you risk trying to make sense with them while they keep on fighting you? Negotiate their surrender, keep fighting. Let's say we negotiate. If we negotiate, up to three heroes spend their actions to roll a d6 and add their collective willpower to the roll. If the total is higher than 11, they surrender. You may receive the alien capture loot as normal. If you keep fighting, all enemy resistance drops by two this turn. So that's pretty cool because it gives, uh, let's say, a cinematic feel to it and it makes it, uh, makes it even more um, uh, responsive to you know, the course of the, the game itself. The next thing that I want to mention briefly is the Aether because uh, Aether is very important. Uh, after the upkeep, we move to Aether. What we do here is uh, we use our imagination to awaken the power slabbering within you. you. Remember, our heroes were cosplay heroes, so they were playing to be uh, Thor or dressed up like, a, I don't know, a Star Trek, Star Trek officer or something respectively. So during the, uh, using the Aether on this uh, space shuttle, which actually it's an advanced alien technology that allows what you're thinking to materialize it so you start becoming your hero and achieving and grasping their uh, skills and powers so they will start behaving like Thor they will start behaving like a wizard or uh, uh, you know Cthulhu or whatever which means they will get their respective abilities so when you use uh, your imagination to awaken the power slumbering within you for each hero a player controls uh, that player draws a crystal from the ether pouch so you pick up your ether pouch, which as I mentioned many times, starts like that and it gets enhanced down the road. And let's say I had six heroes because we're playing a two player game. My uh, colleague would have another six heroes. So I start and imagine this is my pouch, making it for this should be drawn randomly from the pouch. So I draw one crystal randomly from the pouch and placing it on each of those heroes that they are active. This way, um, ether crystals are going to be accumulated on the cards and these heroes down the road will have more possibilities to use the respective 
additional skills that are described at the bottom of the card by spending the specific uh, amount or combination of uh, um, ether crystals to do enhanced skills that will make the difference. So uh, it's important that uh, because you have that many crystals and not more, if you don't want uh, a crystal you can draw, uh, put it back in the pouch because you're planning to use it later on for example. Then the next thing that we have, remember the combat has upkeep, ether, and the next thing that we have, the third one is movement. There is no time to lose so you get to man your stations so each hero can uh, move a number of hexes up to their agility skill plus one. So for example this guy has an agility skill of one so one plus one two he can move up to two hexes so he can come here for example. And the same goes with all the heroes uh, we discuss together because it's a co-op game and we make the best choice to move accordingly putting the correct people correct heroes to the correct location in order to man the correct uh, control room to do a fight and uh, generate shields generate uh, engine uh, energy etc the next thing which is the the majority of uh, this uh, combat phase is the action it's time to make yourself useful so this phase has six steps which are resolved in order the repair the fight the engines the thrusters, the weapons and the shields. In each step players announce which heroes, uh, if any, will take that action and each hero can take only one action during the entire action phase and after acting you return a hero to the side so you tap them as a reminder that they have played so you don't play it again by mistake. Heroes may act in uh, any order but all actions from each step repair, fight, engine, thrusters, weapons and shield, these are the steps, must be completely resolved before moving to the next step. Activating any ether ability is an action. So for example, I can choose to do one ether for this guy using one of their special abilities and this is considered to be one action for them and then they're done. So the breakdown of the actions are the following. First is the repair. For an action, the hero removes a number of damage cubes up to the engineering skill or their activated ether ability from the hex. So again, let's say we had a couple of damages here from previous rounds. This guy has an engineering skill of three, meaning that uh, they can, for one action, remove three damage cubes from this uh, section that they're located and repair it. The same goes with all the heroes around the, the different rooms of the USS Freedom and they can repair any damages they have uh, in their location. Next is the fight. This means about, uh, this is a fight about any potential aliens that may have boarded you during uh, various events. So you're fighting someone on the USS Freedom itself. So it's not a ground battle, it, uh, you, it works like a ground battle similarly, but it, uh, it is fighting that happens at this stage because you have to fight this. So in order to fight uh, one of uh, uh, those units that may have boarded you, you do it now at this stage. So it's considered like a, a, a basic uh, attack that you can do, for example, or you can do another ether ability to attack them. Next is uh, the engines. So repair, fight, engines. You produce two energy cubes for each upgraded engine hex and assign them between thrusters, weapons and shield hexes in any way you wish. So these guys here, if they produce, they're going to produce uh, two energy cubes for each upgraded engine hex they have. Uh, plus they're going to produce energy cubes because they have an input themselves. So any upgraded uh, hex will produce two um, action, two energy cubes. So for example, you can have two here produced with this upgraded one. And then on top of that, if there is a hero standing on an engine hex, we have one here and one here in this example, they're going to uh, produce energy. They may use their action to produce energy, additional energy that is, to the hero's uh, engineering skill uh, or any other activated ether ability uh, accordingly. So they assign the cubes as described above. So this guy, for example, he has an engineering of three, so he produces another three energy cubes as an action, and he's done. Then we have the thrusters. So I'm repeating again, but it's just because it is not complex. You just need to do it a couple of times and then you remember everything. We have in the action repair, phase, repair fight engines, thrusters, weapons and shield. We're at thrusters now. 
So for the thrusters, you produce two thrust cubes for each upgraded thruster. Again, uh, you can produce thrusters for two of those upgraded, um, two for each of those upgraded um, hexes. And then you flip the enemy thruster chips and add their number to the thruster value listed in the encounter card. The result is the enemy enemy's thrust. If there is a hero, meaning we'll flip that, and it is one plus what they have on their card, so they have uh, two thrusters, for example. Now, that's the thruster indication, and we add this chip here. If a hero standing on a thruster hex, we have here a hero standing on a, a thruster hex, that's one or four uh, hex, number one or number four, then uh, they may use their action to spend an energy cube from that hex, so they spend an energy cube here, from there. Uh, the, two thrust, the two thrusters produced from the hex upgraded itself, we don't put it here because it's going to be mixed with uh, the energy cubes. We put it here on the thrusters, let's say, for example. And then uh, if you have a hero standing there, they can um, decide uh, if they want to spend some of the previously allocated energy to produce additional thruster. So what they do is uh, you can uh, spend one of uh, the energy cubes. So I'm spending one to produce the amount of thruster equal to my agility. So this lady here has agility of three, Panthera, that's why I put her on thrusters. So by spending one energy cube, I produce three thrusters because she has three uh, agility. So three more thrusters here. And then I can spend each additional one for conversion one to one. So one for one more thruster, maybe stop, or maybe one more for one more thruster. And I can do uh, something like that, for example. Now, at the end of this step, you compare your thruster with the total thruster of your enemy. The enemy has one, plus one, two. I have a lot of thruster here, so we compare this. Depending on the result, if the enemy has more thrust than you, nothing happens. Otherwise, if you manage to get more thruster than the enemy, uh, you can choose one of the three options. You can have a vantage point where you flip a shield token face up, so you know what's coming. This is a vantage. You know that this shield here is linked with this specific icon, so you need to fire from here to make damage there. We're going to explain how this works later on. You can either do that or um, do evasive maneuvers. You choose one quadrant of uh, the starship board, upper left, upper right, lower left or lower right, and remove from it a number of attack chips equal to the difference between your thrust and the enemies. So here, for example, it's, I forget about this uh, tile. Let's say I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven thruster minus two, five. So the two are used to match this. So I have difference of four. So I can uh, remove up to three thruster doing evasive maneuvers to remove from one quadrant, only from one, uh, that number of uh, attack chips equal to my difference. Okay, so that's a, a clever way to avoid being hit uh, by doing uh, evasive maneuvers, and that's very, very thematic. And the last thing is the full throttle. If, uh, you have tr if you're trying to flee, you place a bronze cube on a space of the thruster track at uh, the bottom of the starship board. This is at the bottom here. I'm not going to move the cards now because it's under there. So uh, you place uh, one bronze cube there. And if you are pursuing a fleeing uh, spacecraft or encountering a space phenomena, uh, add before the thrusters check a silver cube on the thruster track. If you achieve full throttle, then you remove all silver cubes from the thruster's track, and each space on the thruster's track can hold one bronze and one silver cube. If the cubes of a single color fill all three space of the spaces of the track, the combat phase ends immediately, and if combat ends in this way, you do not receive any encounter reward, but that's a quick, a clever way to uh, escape, actually, if uh, the opponent is very strong or if you're not managing to succeed in your mission. So, this is how thrusters work. Then we move to the action weapons. So anyone who's uh, located on weapon systems, they can use this action. The best defense is the good offense. 
In order to perform this action, the hero must be standing on a weapon hex, 5, 2, 3 or 6 if upgraded, and spend an energy cube that was previously distributed to them from the engine room in order to perform an attack. So if uh, they spend an energy cube on that hex, they choose a sealed uh, chip, one of those four blue ones that are on the top, and uh, from there what they can do they're trying to match the symbols. So for example, because we did uh, before uh, the vantage point, we have already revealed this one. So we know that if we, uh, we can directly hit and fire from this one, because we know that firing from this weapon will match this symbol here. This is a symbol on this hex as well. And we, will create, and we can inflict up to six damage. We'll see how this works. But if for some reason I had uh, no um, shields revealed. What I can do is I can uh, spend one of uh, these energy cubes to uh, reveal one and then I compare the symbol with what I have here to see if I have a match and I can pass through uh, my attack. Otherwise if there is no match you cannot pass it at this stage. So if the symbols match the attack hits and the hero deals damage equal to their agility skill uh, or any other activated ether ability. So that's why you need to have in generally good agility here it's better to put heroes with good agility because they can inflict up to uh, that damage uh, for example by spending by matching the symbol so if this if Lana was here uh, or how is she called I don't remember if she was here for one cube she can pass her agility three spend one cube and pass three damages damage cubes to the matching symbol here and the way you calculate that is you take three uh, cubes and you put it there as hit points because this uh, alien spacecraft can take up to 23 before they are destroyed. Uh, once uh, per round, if a hero is taking this action, is standing on an upgraded hex weapon, you can deal two additional damage. No matter what the enemy, cannot be dealt more damage than what the shield locates. So for example, indicates. So for example, this one cannot take more than six, even if you were able to inflict more than six damage with your hit. Just to show this, uh, uh, in more detail, let's say for example this hero has an agility of 3 and previously there were 4 energy cubes on this one and match from here to this shield which is revealed and has a 6 uh, value here. So what happens is I can spend 1 to inflict the damage up to my agility which is 3, so 3 damage here and then I can start adding 1 in a ratio 1 to 1, 4, 5, 6 to pass six damage all the way to the maximum cap which is located here. If I had even one more I could not spend it to, to pass seven damage because I can only inflict up to six damage to this shield. For this shield I need to be firing from this respective weapon matching the icon and I can pass up to five damage. For this up to seven but I need to fire from here and for that one up to four and I need to fire from here. So these are always the same four uh, shield chips that we are going to be used, but they're going to be shuffled each and every time, uh, depending the encounter. So, and every round, if we move to the second round of combat, they're going to be shuffled again, so you'll need to have the same process uh, repeated. So this is how uh, the action of weapons uh, is used. So as I mentioned before, we keep track of the damage uh, gathering on the uh, spacecraft or the alien. So this guy, for example, they have 5 plus 5, 10, 13 out of 23. If at some point uh, uh, there is enough damage to match or um, go beyond the health points, the health points of the card, then uh, that enemy is destroyed and the combat phase ends. Of course, if we manage to succeed, then we proceed to the rewards because we managed to win this encounter. The next uh, step that we do is the shields. We're still in the battle. We have attacked using our weapons. The last thing that we do is the shields. So for using the shields, what we do is in order to perform this action, the hero must be standing on the shield hex. This is 12 or 9, numbered there, if you have upgraded 9, because otherwise it's going to be cargo. And then you get to, uh, to choose a quadrant. You spend an energy cube on that hex, choose a quadrant of the starship 
board, upper left, upper right, lower left or lower right, and place there a number of shield cubes equal to the hero strength skill or activated ether ability. And you can also convert any number of energy cubes uh, on the hex into additional shield cubes. Once per round, if a hero is taking this action standing on one upgraded uh, shield hex, they place two additional shield cubes. So let's say, for example, Thor here, sitting on number nine. Uh, they can, and let's say they have uh, three uh, cubes there. So they can spend as an action one cube to prepare to sell to produce three shields with one as per strength. They have three strength. They can add the fourth one and a fifth one. And since they are sitting on an upgraded tile, they can add two more. And then they choose a quadrant, this one, that one, that one, or that one. And then they place here on the shield icon this number of um, respective uh, tokens. That means that this is the shields that they're going to try to negate the damage from this attack. So you're planning this stay from combat round to combat round, so you can be accumulating different shield cubes here, here, here and here in order to prepare for attacks from the different uh, directions respectively in the future combat rounds. So after all the sequence uh, I'm repeating repair, fight, engines, thruster and weapon and engines. The last thing that happens is the enemy takes their turn. You're done, you do whatever you have done whatever you could at this stage and you hope it's enough. You turn all attack chips face up it could be in more than one sections, quadrants, okay? So then what happens is you reveal the damage and then you see that here, for example, I have five plus five, that's a big damage, 14. I can try to negate uh, damage, so I can try to say that, uh, let's say that this will attack number 12, so I'll get four here. This will give me five on the 11, okay? And this will give me uh, another five damage on the number 10. And let's say I already had one damage here, and that's a bit of a, a problem. Uh, keep in mind that the type of damage that you're receiving is linked with the type of the skill that it's been used. So if this was uh, a, a, a blue, red, or yellow attack, it will be a pyro missile, three missiles, four missiles, respectively. So it has to do with the skill of uh, the encounter uh, spacecraft. So let's say for the benefit of uh, any example, this was a, a simple attack. That means that uh, le uh, let's say I already had one damage there. So I want to protect my engine because it produces energy. So I want energy. So I want to neglect the damage here because I don't want to have another five here. This can take up to 10. So it has already one. So let's say I'm spending one, two, three, four, five, all five of them to stop this damage. So this counter um, counters the attack. So that's done. So this goes back at the bottom of <coughs> a discard pile or the bottom of uh, the attack. And then I have five damage here, which let's say for the benefit of the example, there were a simple damage on the hex 11. So I get five damage here and four damage on hex 12, where it's a sealed generator. And I get four damage here. Uh, each tile, each room can take up to 10 and then if something goes beyond, uh, then we destroy the room if we reach 10 uh, health points because they get blown and then we have a, a breach in the hull, which essentially blows up our USS Freedom uh, spacecraft. So that's why you need to rep uh, repair them gradually, as previously indicated. But if this was um, a pyro damage, it will have additional things, so it would be something like that, meaning that they could cause also damage to the hero standing, also to adjacent ones. We'll see how this works down uh, the road. So this is how <coughs> the enemy uh, stage, the enemy uh, attack works. So now it's a good opportunity to describe the rest of the damage uh, types as well. So we have the normal damage, we have the fire damage. At the end of each upkeep phase, this hex and all heroes on this hex uh, add uh, one damage. So both the hex itself and the heroes standing on this hex. And this damage cannot be prevented by spending uh, shield cubes. So if that was a, a pyro damage, this will be inflicted. So you need to be very, very careful on this one. Uh, so all heroes on this hex 
and all adjacent hexes. So if that was here, I will, I, this guy would be damaged and this guy would be damaged because it's an adjacent hero, plus the tile itself. So pretty nasty. Then we have the radiation damage. During the engine step of the action phase, whenever a hero generates energy cubes, they generate one fuel cube for every damage cube on a radiation chips. In addition, as long as one or more radiation chips are on any hex, all heroes on the spacecraft take one damage at the end of the upkeep phase. Ouch. And the last one is the virus damage. So when heroes are on the same hex as a virus chip, any damage dealt to them is doubled. And in addition, as long as one or more virus chips are on any hex, uh, the movement of all heroes on the spacecraft is reduced by one. Extremely, extremely painful. So there are a couple of rules about Titans. Titans do not use the sealed chips that we've seen here on the top. Uh, all attacks during the weapons phase hit automatically. However, you place just one damage cube on the Titan's card for every five damage dealt on it and any leftovers below five are ignored. And a Titan power attack targets a single hex and you roll a d12 only once and place all attack chips in the position space corresponding to that roll. So they're pretty uh, focusing on specific hexes of our spaces uh, on our spacecraft. We have also some uh, space phenomena rules. During the thrusters phase of the action step, if your thrust is less than the phenomenon thrust, you place one silver cube on the space of the thrusters track that does not already have a silver cube. Uh, if all three spaces of the thrusters track have silver cubes, the USS Freedom is destroyed by the phenomena pool into a black hole or something like that, and tidal forces and, uh, are destroying everything in its path. The players lose the campaign, unfortunately. During the weapon step, if an attack hits the phenomena, you do not deal damage. Instead, up to three heroes on the bridge, the bridge is this tile here, the zero one, uh, can take an action to place the encounter card a number of, on the encounter card a number uh, of cubes equal to that hero's engineering or skill. Uh, then the number of cubes equal to uh, when the number of cubes there are equal or greater than uh, what uh, it's demanded by the phenomena, then they decipher the phenomena and they decipher the score and then of course they manage to contain and understand the phenomena and safely move out of the combat phase like that because they understood how it works. So this is how uh, space combat works. There are a few differences for ground combat when we move to ground over here. So uh, uh, for ground combat in regards to ether, uh, you use your ether again to enhance your, uh, your abilities. The ground combat uh, has some similar steps and some differences. So here the ground combat goes through five different steps. We have the upkeep, the ether, the movement, the action, which can either be other ability attack basic attack or use an item and then we have the movement the enemy phase which is movement and action from the enemy uh, of course here uh, you have some uh, minor details like uh, uh, when you start the combat you place them on uh, the hexes 10 11 12 9 8 and 7 the heroes that is and the enemies go on the other hexes and you can interact you can uh, make some uh, uh, basic attack by using your strength by using bare hands or doing aether attacks etc I'm not going to go into more details because this is very very simple and just the difference is that you go through the different steps upkeep, ether, movement, the actions that you take from the heroes and then the enemy turn, mean, meaning movement and action and then the result of uh, the ground combat uh, will be dictating how we move forward again. Just as a quick note you can have a mixed combat, sometimes you can have also combat on the ground but also combat on the uh, respectively uh, on the air supporting the ground combat and this is an interesting scenario as well and then this is how the combat works again you can do fleeing uh, or you can uh, decide to flee essentially to avoid a damage from the ground like we do with um, the space combat so after we finish with all these um, phases we had the interstellar phase, we have the navigating, navigation phase, we have the encounter phase, we had the combat phase, whether it was space or ground combat, and then we move to the conclude phase, the cleanup phase. 
In the cleanup phase, you reap the rewards from your successful encounters, at least hopefully. You may also trade with alien civilizations and purchase upgrade tiles for the USS Freedom. This is how you get those fancy nice upgrades, so instead of having only one shield, you have two shields, two engines, etc. It's very important to upgrade your uh, spacecraft because you will face more strong and more difficult challenges down the road. As soon as uh, the cleanup phase is concluded, the game session uh, is considered to end, so you can uh, always play one more, but you can also save it before proceeding to the next one. There are different encounter rewards depending on uh, the card itself. So for example, I'm just going to, uh, let's say, take one to show you some encounter rewards. So depending on, uh, on the card, if you manage to be successful against these guys, you can have different um, rewards depending of course on the role. So if you are between seven and 15, they're hailing us on the screen and then you can have the option to uh, uh, do this or that or that. And in any case, this is what is affected. So you can see that the symbols indicate various things. You can have either ether enhancement, you can have minor loot or major loot, loot when you have two arrows. You can have a credits uh, one this way when you have a credit icon. I think one of the other cards, yeah, this is a credit icon that you can see here. Uh, you can have also uh, some uh, um, glory or fame or infamy. So essentially you can gain reputation and this is included in this hexes here. So for example, this one shows that with this type of uh, civilization, this type of core world, uh, you're going to be, since this is a green arrow, you're going to be receiving fame, reputation sector and green arrow, increase the reputation in this capital world by one. So this is how you gain reputation respectively by uh, doing something that makes sense for uh, this encounter, this enemy or whatever. Or again, you can also lose. Of course, all this is uh, uh, known before you dive into the, the combat. So you take under consideration this for your choices respectively. So this is important uh, because this is the majority of the rewards that you'll be getting from different encounters and this is how you're trying to improve your spacecraft, uh, make trades, uh, improve your diplomatic relations with each other because remember you need to go all the way up to six with these guys or whichever core world you choose and try to pursue their specific victory condition depending on which alien you're uh, pursuing. So, these are the basic rules. Of course, I explained everything to you. It may be that in the first uh, adventures, this will be easier. You're just going to go through a simple, uh, possibly encounter, just do a space uh, combat and that's it. You don't have to do uh, different things like uh, combined uh, ground combat and space combat, etc. So once you get the habit of it, it gets easier. There are a lot of things running in this game, but the, nothing that it doesn't make sense or it doesn't click together with the rest of the mechanics. So. In a nutshell, maybe that's a bit longer than a nutshell, this is how you play USS Freedom. Okay, so this was a long video because I tried to explain everything. So I, I shown you the cases of space combat, of ground combat, of uh, various uh, interactions with different miniatures. I mean, you can uh, have uh, the devourer of wards, destroyer of wards, destroying some planets altogether, or you can have Excalibur hunting down pirates, trying to, uh, to kill them and in a nutshell through the movement of the minis on the interstellar map because you see like an overview of what's outside the surrounding like you zoom out and you see the map uh, you could it could be that some of the minis completely go out of the game in, in the beginning of the game or in the middle of the campaign because they crash on each other so you never get to encounter them or uh, you will encounter them because uh, you will be flying directly to them and you will be intercepting them or choosing to to attack them because it's one of uh, the things you want to do to gain uh, some uh, upper hand in your mission so in any case Whatever path you choose to do, you feel like you're in the driving position. You and your friends collectively uh, try to make careful decisions on where to navigate, which encounters to approach and what to actually to, to go for, and what the benefits of those uh, encounters will be for you to, to grasp, to gain, in order to come one step closer to winning the game, winning the campaign. But I'm sure but even at the end of the game, if, even if you don't win the campaign, just going through several of those adventures and having a story that clicks and continues uh, and in a narrative way, and you see the involvement and the evolution and uh, you know the upgrade of your spaceship, it's really, really cool. So I enjoyed the mechanics a lot, and I felt like I had every time to do meaningful uh, decisions who hero I sent where, 
what location I'm mounting, where to take damage, should I uh, choose to take damage here or there on this squadron of the ship? Shall I take and push my luck and get more damage here or not? Uh, can I make it a more calculated risk or go full uh, strategy and try to deflect everything? It's up to me. Of course, uh, the heroes have different abilities. I mean, uh, the idea of the ether and uh, essentially this is a bug builder because you use the ether crystals to enhance the various abilities of your heroes and essentially having the right crystal at the right moment uh, it can give you the upper hand because not only you can do the basic actions that you're looking for in uh, the course of the game but you can use a specific crystal to do very very cool things that will tip the balance to your favor so all these cool ideas click together very well I know it may seem a lot of details at the beginning but uh, I'm sure after a couple of one or two adventures everything makes sense you just need to make one space battle and one space combat and then you know how space combat works you need to make one space uh, ground battle ground combat and then you know how ground battle works and all together it will come like a series in an episode as the publisher advertises and I really think that they nailed it there in the description it's like watching or uh, directing as an episode in a sci-fi series one out, of, one out of 36 down the road that will give you a story uh, with a beginning, a middle and the end and you're part of it, this story, you and your friends so very flexible uh, game I like the, the open world of it I mean I make my own decisions where I go I can completely flee from difficult uh, opponents uh, never touch the side of the galaxy go for something else completely or focus on combat or focus on uh, boarding other uh, spacecraft and uh, gaining a lot of loot and reward from my missions etc it's up to me of course I need to get better stronger and there is a dual improvement level uh, case a process in this uh, game it is improving your spacecraft USS Freedom needs to be improved. You need more shields, more engines, more maneuvering thrusters and more um, uh, weapons. But you also need more powerful uh, pouch building. That's why you enhance your ether because you are able to have more powerful red crystals instead of blue and thus being able to use more powerful abilities than your starting abilities. The system of the combat of the game is very unique and very interesting, feels very fresh. I've never seen something like that. It has some uh, uh, hidden information element that I need to, to navigate, to decide where I um, direct my power, my, my attack, especially for the space combat. Uh, I mean, the components of the game, it, it's, it's uh, amazing. It's, it's really, this is a prototype and I'm just, it's jaw, jaw dropping what I see in front of my eyes, really. I, these guys are amazing. So the last thing I want to mention is, all of it looks tremendously well thought. It looks like there's been a lot of development, a lot of thought around this game. So to give you a full experience, and uh, it may take you more than 60 minutes for the first round, but once you get first adventure, but once you get to, to play a couple of more adventures, then you won't need more than uh, 60 minutes to finish an adventure, even less than that, even 45. Uh, the only negative thing I can think about the game, which is uh, actually something that maybe you can compensate, is this game is literally the devourer of the table. <laughs> you need a tremendous amount of space to set it up. And the reason for that is because everything is huge. I mean, and I can't complain about huge because it looks great on the table, but look at the size of this card. This is a normal card, Magic the Gathering size, and this is a, the majority of the cards that you see from the encounters. I mean, look at that, really. And uh, the boards are huge, uh, the spacecraft is huge. One thing no one can complain about this game is that they cannot see well the iconography or read what is uh, going on or identify the symbols because everything is, is so big and so well distributed uh, for us not to be distracted by reading between lines or whatever. Extremely well done, a great project, very, very well thought. I really, really enjoyed. This is a beautiful space adventure. I highly recommend it. This is USS Freedom. <laughs>